Hello, church. Welcome to this week's sermon. My name is Henry Loke. This is God's feeding station for those who are new. Thanks for being here and thanks for joining us for this week's sermon. Doing it a little different today, kind of a little bit more relaxed. I was thinking about it. I say this on the scripture broadcast all the time because it's not the pristine thing, right? It's not the uh, the um, that perfect broadcast, you know, it's not always quiet. It's not always, you know, your dog, We <laughs> when we had Zeke, you'd hear him gnawing on bones in the background and stuff. So it's not the, um, the pristine, quiet thing um, that maybe some people are used to, but that's not what this is. This is a a working ministry and it's a a walking out of faith type ministry and so you kind of get it warts and all here at the feeding station and i kind of like that i i like not putting on false pretenses so to speak so we're doing it a little different today uh because of that i want to kind of portray more of who and what god's feeding station really is it's not You know, this church type thing in that sense, it's an online thing and it's a walk through faith. So I want this to be a little bit more realistic. Uh, Also doing it, you see the mic here today. I'm in the studio. You see Pro Tools running in the background. The audio portion of the sermon has not been up to, and and as as I say, I, you know, we're not the perfect thing, but the audio thing has been driving me crazy. It's not been great. And so... We're going to try to record the audio today and match it up to the video, just get a little bit better uh, audio quality and, and hopefully make some changes there if, it, if I can get it to work. So uh, that's the point of this as well today. So it's kind of more for, I guess, me and, and my my quirks and, and what I want the audio to be rather than anybody else, but that's the way it is. So with that, um, another thing, I just want to give you a little quick uh, snippet. It's been a busy week here uh, at the feeding station. For those who know me, uh, I coach soccer as well, and so we've opened up to the point here in Colorado where we're we're moving forward and and having uh, we had tryouts this week, and you know just are planning on having a season in the fall, and so but with tryouts comes a lot of emotion and a lot of uh drama you know when you when you're moving kids up and down and and you're making cuts and stuff and can get pretty emotional and so uh, a bunch of us here that uh still get together from new day we talked about it last week and i had you know we were i had a bunch asked a bunch of people to pray for tryouts because it can be pretty pretty crazy uh and i it was probably one of the smoothest tryouts if not the smoothest tryout i've ever had and and so I just I want to give that to you as an encouragement to know that concerted prayer does work. I mean, I can't tell you all the things uh, that happened this week where just things just lined up and God just brought this whole thing together uh, on on a you know in a bunch of different ways. And so I want to just give that to you to encourage you to pray because prayer does work and and concerted prayer by by a number of people will invoke God to act on our behalf. So I just wanted to give that to you before we get started today. We are in Luke, again today, Luke 31 through 36. We began, this is part two of what we began last week, loving your enemies. Uh, And we did Luke, we started in Luke uh, 27 last week and read through to verse 31. We're going to begin at verse 32 again today, and as I said, it's a part two of, of talking about how we deal with people that we sometimes, and again, the enemy thing, I want to be careful because this is not just about loving your enemies, it's loving everyone, and in this day and age, with all that's going on in the world, it's loving people who we disagree with, it's loving people that we may have passionate disagreements with. Uh, and passionate arguments with, and people who don't think as we think or feel as we feel. And so it's loving those people, loving all people as Christ loved us. So we begin in verse 32 today. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them, right? To love for love, to love those who love us, it's a natural thing. We naturally gravitate to that, don't we? It's easy to love somebody who we have a lot in common with, who we share uh, likes and dislikes with. It's just a natural thing that happens. 
Uh, it's, just, it's very common. And it's kind of nature's way, isn't it? But to love those who are at enmity with us, who disagree with us, there's self-denial in, involved in that because I have to put aside the disagreements. I have to put aside if I'm offended. I have to put aside my emotions and my my thoughts in, in, in some way to to just go, I love that person for who they are because... I have to set aside my issues with them. I have to get past their issues with me. We have to put all of those things aside and we have to love people for who they are and who they are are God's children. So regardless, of, because the, the love of Christ has no boundaries. There's no framework around that. It's unconditional love. So it's not based on politics. It's not based on race. It's not based on financial status. It's not based on what neighborhood I live in. It's not based on what team I root for. It's not based on how I feel about certain things. Face masks, COVID, stay in, go out, open up, stay close. It has nothing to do with that. Christ loves unconditionally regardless of who we are and our beliefs. Now, salvation and all of that, there are contingents on that, accepting the free gift of salvation from God, trusting in Christ as our Savior, understanding sin and all of that. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about Jesus going to the cross out of love for all of us. He went to the cross for all of us. Now it's up to us to decide on the salvation piece, to accept a gift or not accept a gift. But again, I said this before, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing, is what he said on the cross. Forgive them, right? Those who beat him, those who crucified him, Judas who betrayed him, those who abandoned him, those who were mocking him at the time, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. So his love knows no bounds. It's not in a box. It, it has no label on it. He doesn't love if A, B, C, or D. And we're supposed to, as Christians, as followers of Jesus, portray that love to all people in a like manner. We make the choice regardless of our differences. And that's the self-denial piece. I'm going to deny how I feel and what my beliefs are and just see them as a child of God and make the choice to love them. And that's what I think he's talking about here because as you move on to, to verse 33, it's a little bit of the same thing. He says, if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do that. Again, it's that same thing. It's like for like. The world does that. It's a common principle. It's custom. Common principle of honor and kindness that we return like for like. And here's, here's, the, here's the thing. If we behave as the world behaves, then there is no difference to the world, right? We show nothing different to the world as to the ways of God and to the ways of man. Remember, Scripture tells us the ways of the world and the ways of God are at odds. They, they, don't, they don't mesh because as man, as creation, we are born with a sinful nature. And so whether it's justice or judging or whatever we do, it's tainted with that, where God is righteous and holy. His ways are pure. His justice is just. There are no mistakes. And we've talked about this before. And so we bring nothing else to the table when we try to honor God and honor Jesus, but yet act as if there's no difference between what Jesus demands of his disciples and what the world demands in general. So what I'm saying is, as we live out this life of faith, as we walk this life of faith, there has to be a difference. And, and we know there is a difference. When you look at what Jesus did, how he interacted with people, there was a huge difference between him and how he behaved towards people. And how, say, the Pharisees, 
who were operating in the framework of the world behaved or how other people behaved, you know, that were around him. I mean, I, I go to blind Bartimaeus. I go to the lepers, right? Blind Bartimaeus is yelling at the side of the road. People are telling him to shut up. Jesus calls him. Lepers come into town, crying unclean. People scatter. Jesus goes to them. They want to stone the woman caught in adultery. Jesus defends her. You, there's a difference. And so if we're trying to honor God, we're trying to honor Jesus by adopting and believing in God's commandments and God's precepts, yet, you know, or claiming that we're disciples of Jesus, yet we behave as the world behaves, the world sees nothing different. And, uh, you know, I think, and, and you see it now, uh, uh, people go, well, what's the big deal? You know, the divorce rate's the same. You, 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 Act and uh, act in hateful ways and say hateful things, just like the world does. You're prejudiced, as the world is prejudiced. What's the difference? That's the thing. There should be a difference when we're following Jesus and and putting on His yoke and putting on His burden and being a follower of His and trying to live, allow Him to live His life out through us. The world should see a difference, and we have to know. We have to make that choice to behave differently. So we have to remember that those that don't have a personal relationship with Jesus will behave in that same manner if we only follow worldly rules. We have to have that deep personal relationship with Jesus to know that he's the one we count on and to allow him to show us how to deal with these certain situations. Because if we try to do it on our own, we're just going to behave as the world behaves. We're to outdo the world, right? Those, um, because those who do not know God, right? We have to do what those who do not have that personal relationship with Jesus wouldn't do, right? We have to do the things that those who are just simply in the world wouldn't do. We have to render good for evil. And we have to do so without expecting any thanks, without expecting any praise, maybe expecting it to be rejected, maybe expecting to be vilified. But we do these things because we are obedient to Christ and because we desire to bring honor and glory to God and then our thanks will come from Him. And we do these things because it is Jesus' way. It is the right thing to do. Jesus didn't do these things based on legalism. He did them out of love. He did them because it's the right thing to do. He loved because God loves us. God wishes good for us. God wants us to have these things that we so desire. It's the right thing to do. And so as we move on to Luke 34 and 35, and if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. That last statement is huge. He is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. If we, are, if we are disciples of Jesus, as he was kind, even like to the Pharisees, and you think of those arguments they would have, the things that he said to them were out of love. They weren't out of hate. They weren't out of frustration. They were out of love trying to get them to understand. They were harsh sometimes, but he was doing it out of his love for them, to get them to see who he was. We are to behave in the same way. We are to lend, not expecting anything in return, without reservation, without hesitation. Listen to what God says in Deuteronomy 15, 7. And, and this is the cool thing, because Jesus is just, just taking these, these teachings of the Old Testament, these things of God, and just continuing to teach them to us. 
And it shows that the things of the Old Testament are just as valid today as they were then. Listen to what Deuteronomy 15 says, 7 through 10. If among you, one of your brothers should become poor in any of your towns within your land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not harden your heart or shut your hand against your poor brother, but you shall open your hand to him and lend him sufficient for his need, whatever it may be. Take care, lest there be an unworthy thought in your heart and you say, the seventh year, the year of release is near and your eye look grudgingly on your poor brother and you give him nothing. And he cry to the Lord against you and you be guilty of sin. You shall give to him freely and your heart shall not be grudging when you give to him because for this, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in all that you undertake. See, Jesus told us we were always going to have the poor with us, but he, but he would not always be with us. So we're gonna have to, how are we gonna deal with this? How are we going to react to those in need? I talked a little bit about this last week. Do we give grudgingly? Do we tally it up first? And, and, and it's not to say we give unconsciously, that we don't look at our situation and we put ourselves in a bind because we're being generous. God doesn't expect that of us. He's not telling us to be thoughtless in our actions. But we are to care for those in need according to what we are able to do out of the kindness and generosity of our hearts. Right, Because if our hands are shut and we, again, you, you, go, you, you, you put yourself first, right? We're back to that self-denial thing. If there is somebody in need and I have the means, but I have to sacrifice something of my own that I can do without, that's, and, I, and, then, I, and then I give freely knowing that, that's, that's, that's being generous. That's the generosity and the charity and the love God is looking for. But when we don't do that, if our hands are close, we harden our hearts. Now we're, we're kind of keeping everything close to the vest. I want to keep because I want, you know, I can get this if I don't give. And, and you know, so I'm just going to keep what I have for me. The needs of those now matter more than the wants of us down the road. If there is an immediate need, we are to provide for that. Our hands are to be open wide in such a way that is sufficient for the need. Again, not carelessly, not thoughtlessly, but to help that it, in a way that will make a difference. We should not be loath to part with our money. We should not be hesitant to part with it. Nor are we to think it scattered to the wind or given to somebody where they're just going to, you know, when we have that thought, wow, they're just going to waste it on X, Y, and Z. We're not to have that thought. It's not up to us. We're not to give grudgingly. We're to give freely. If somebody expresses a need, we assess the situation. We give charitably. We're to trust then too in the providences of God, then to supply us and give us what we freely need. God says, we will be blessed in all our work and all that we undertake when we give in such a like manner. So we trust in the providence of God then to replenish and to take care of us, right? He gives freely, doesn't he? He gives freely. He expects nothing in return as far as repayment. He doesn't expect a material repayment. His generosity and his love and his grace and his mercy Demand respect, demand love, demand obedience, but it's not from a legalism perspective. We should give in the same way and just know that when we do that, there's a satisfaction in our souls, a satisfaction in our hearts that we have provided for somebody and that we have honored God by obeying his commands concerning these things. And then we build up treasure. And our interest, you know, we talk about loaning out things with interest and gaining it back with interest. 
Our interest is supposed to be stored in heaven. And when we give in this way, that's where it's stored. We build up the treasure and the interest of heaven. And that will be returned to us, <clears throat> excuse me, eventually at the appropriate time. What is given or lent freely with a cheerful and glad heart will be made up and laid up for us in eternity. And that's to our advantage. We will not only be repaid eventually, we will be rewarded for obeying God's word. We're to resemble God in his goodness, in his charity, in his love. Because to his glory, he is kind to all, to the faithful and the unfaithful, to those who are thankful, to those who are thankless. Matthew 5, 45, Jesus says, for he, God, makes the sun rise on evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. God gives liberally, and we are to do the same. He gives gifts to the worst of us. He gives gifts to those who provoke him. He gives gifts and life and provides to those who disobey him and dishonor him. We are to do the same so that our Father in heaven will then honor us for our obedience to him and our kindness and our love then that we show to his children. We let God deal with, with all the other things, we are called to provide when there is a need. Luke 6.36, it says, be merciful even as your father is merciful. In Matthew 5.48, at the end of, of the similar text, Jesus says, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. We're to imitate God in every way humanly possible. We look at Jesus. Jesus. When we want to see what God is like, how God would react, we look at Jesus. Jesus is the exact representation of God, Hebrews says. It says in the book of Hebrews. So we imitate Jesus. We allow Jesus to live his life out through us. But we have to remember, we're not junior messiahs. <laughs> That's the thing, right? We're to imitate God. But we are not gods. We are not God, should say it that way. We are not God. We are not Jesus. We are not junior messiahs. We're to be merciful to all. Good and evil, doesn't matter. We're to be those, uh, we're to love those who appreciate it and those who don't appreciate it. We're, we're enveloped in God's love. God's love surround us, surrounds us, and encompasses us every day. We may not always feel it, but his love toward us is never ending. We're, sur we're, we're to surround the people we come in contact with with that same love as we, got, as we go about our day-to-day -day business. Colossians 3, 12 through 14 says, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. There's your answer. There's your answer, right? Our upper garment, our outer garment, our robe, our overcoat, our coat of arms, is to be our love for one another, our care for one another, our mercy towards one another. We are tasked with this. I said this, was it, I don't know if it was last week or the week before. When are we going to take these words, these assignments, these responsibilities that God gives us, when are we gonna take them seriously? When are we gonna start living them out? And I'm saying this to me as much as I'm saying it to the audience out there. Because here's, in the end, it doesn't matter, in, you know, in the arguments and the disagreements, it doesn't matter from a God perspective if we're vindicated. It doesn't matter. What matters is that we be obedient to God and love as he loves. We need to become and be concerned more with being more like Jesus in our character than winning the argument and being vindicated in our disagreements. 
He needs to become more. We need to become less because all these things are going to pass away. The arguments and the disagreements, all of it is going to pass away. Jesus is going to return and take his rightful place on the throne. We all have to stand before the judgment seat and we're going to have to answer for how our hearts were and our attitudes of our hearts towards our brothers and sisters, period. Again, good and evil, appreciative, not appreciative, those who agree with us, those who disagree with us, it doesn't matter. We're going to have to answer for this, right? So these words in the Bible, it's not there, you know, yeah, kind of something to consider and maybe something to kind of, no. These things are here to live by. They are commandments, they are precepts, and it's not, again, not salvation by works. But if we love Jesus, if we love God, if we have appreciation for him, we want to obey and we want to be obedient and we we want to do those things that he's done out of respect and love for him for what he's done for us. And if we want to make a difference in the world, if we want to bring an end to hate and racism and political arguments and all these things, yeah, we're going to disagree. It's who we are. How we disagree That's the difference. That's the difference. When we engage, we engage with a heart of love. We engage with an intent of understanding where the other person is coming from. We respect their concerns. We may disagree with them, but we respect them out of our love for them because we choose to love them before we even get into the conversation. That's the thing. And because of you know, the differences we have doesn't change that. It doesn't change that because the love comes before anything else. It's not conditional. It's not conditioned on how they feel, what they think, who they're going to vote for. That's the thing. Love comes before all of that. And so we have to love our enemies. We have to exceed them. We have to go beyond the scribes and the Pharisees because our faith in Christ goes far beyond our life in this world. You know it goes far beyond what's here because as I just said, all these things are going to pass away. What we do here though, we're going to have to answer for. We have to do more than others in the world. We have to do more than what the world does. We have to excel in the things of faith more than others excel in the things of the world because we know God and we talk of the things of God. We profess profess faith and the promises of God. God does for us. He provides for us. He protects us. He guides us. And rightly so, he expects more from us. And he expects more from his children than the world expects from hers. We have to rise above all of this. We have to rise above the world and not walk as children of the world, but as children of God and followers of Christ, being molded more and more and more in his image, not ours, not the world's, not what the world, what the world thinks of us doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And it's hard sometimes to to function and deal with that. But our eyes have to be on the prize. I talk about this in soccer all the time. It's not about the sprint. It's about the marathon. You know, when it comes to a soccer player, my son is great at this. He's great at spying out kids who in three years are going to be really good players because he can see and look ahead to go, yeah, they may not be good now, but they have the makings of being a great player down the road. And that's what it's about, right? Kids now, they want to play in college. How are they going to develop over the next three or four years to get where they want to get to, right? How are we going to develop as Christians and people who walk out our faith so that when we finish our race and we get before God, we come before Jesus, they say, well done, good and faithful servant. That's what we're aiming for. It's not about 
being, uh, you know, being accepted by the world, being vindicated by the world. It's not about that. Where do we stand with God? Where do we stand as followers of Christ? This has to be lived out. Because if we don't, the question is going to be why, right? Again, Jesus says, those every, not everybody who cries out, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of, of heaven. We have to start living this stuff out. So while the, while the world renders good for good, followers of Christ render good for evil. We have to rise above our financial standing. We have to rise above our race. We have to rise above our politics, our social media standing. If we desire and expect the rewards as children of God and heirs to his kingdom, then we must rise higher than the virtue of the world. It's just a simple fact. Because again, remember, who's running the world right now? Right, the prince of the air, the temporary, temporary ruler of the world right now is Satan. And the things of the world are at 180 out with the things of God. They're just directly opposite. And so when we try to fix the world with the things of the world, it makes no sense. Trying to fix a fallenness with fallen fallen result with fallen band-aids with with fallen procedures with 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 things that that are have already proven to not work it's almost like you're trying to fix evil with evil We're, again it's a fallen world it's a sinful world and we know that and yet we're trying to fix the things of the world by behaving as the world behaves. It's not logical. You need something different, right? The definition, de definition of insanity, doing the same things over and over and over again, expecting different results. We have to take the things of God and bring them into our world because the things of God are the only things that will overcome the things of the evil one. Jesus said that. He has overcome the world. So it's those things that he teaches us that we need to use to overcome the world. And as I read in Colossians, I'm gonna read it again. Above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. It's pretty simple. It's pretty black and white. We have to decide love has to come first before anything else. Love has to come first. Because if we start off with that as the foundation, the discussions will go easier. The understanding will come. And we will be blessed by God. And watch God heal this land when we attack the things of the world with the love of Christ. Let's pray. Uh, Father, I, I, we, I thank you for your word and I thank you for your lessons. These, these things, they're, they're, they're very clear to me anyway. I, I, and I think they're becoming clearer and clearer to us to know that your ways are the better ways because your ways are of love. It's, you don't have evil intended for us. You have good intended for us. There may be some hard times but it's intended for good so that we grow in faith, we grow in trust, and we grow in our knowledge of you. So, Father, I thank you that you love us and you love us enough to put us through these trials, that you will love us enough that you will, you know, drag us off to Babylon or drag us off to Assyria as you did with Israel, that you will take us to these places to teach us the lessons so that we will turn and repent and come into a deeper relationship with you. I pray that you would do that for us. I pray that you would continue just to open our eyes and open our ears and open our hearts to your ways and to come to know and to trust in them so that we would live them out and live them out boldly 
because we know they're the right things. Jesus lived them out. He showed us they are the right things. They bring peace and love and patience and kindness and forbearance and understanding. Your ways bring those things we so deeply desire. So Father, continue to bring us up and to train us up in your ways. And I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. So I hope this is, you know, didn't didn't throw you off today, uh, but it's just been nice to kind of take it to this level. This is what God's Feeding Station is. And so uh, with that, you know, www.godsfeedingstation.org is the website. Check it out. If you haven't already, we have a lot to offer there besides this weekly sermon. We have daily things going on, scriptures, devotions, prayers, and broadcasts, talking a lot about prayer on the broadcast side, so I would encourage you to check it out. We also have an app that you can download that is free, and everything on the app, um, everything on the website is on the app, so check that out as well. You can check us out on YouTube, and you can email us at gfsministry316 at gmail.com. Again, if you we have a song of the week, and looking for requests, if you have a request for a song that you'd like to hear Maybe that's playing on your heart, a hymn or a modern day, you know, mercy me type thing, whatever it may be. If you have something that you'd like to kind of share with people and to meditate on for the week, you can email that to me and uh, we'll get it up there. So if you have any prayer requests too, you can email those to me or there is a prayer request form on the app. You can fill that out and send it to me and we'll get you on our our prayer list as well. Because as I said at the beginning of the broadcast today, prayer works. I, I, I had five days this week of examples of God answering prayers. And so I speak from experience. You can count on God to, to come uh, to your aid when we lift our, the concerns of our hearts in prayer. With that, I hope you have a great week. I hope you're all healthy. I hope you're all safe. And I hope you're all getting back to some semblance of normal because I know it's, it's weighing on a lot of people. So I'm praying for, praying for all of you out there. I thank you for being here. I so appreciate you. Love all you guys. And Lord willing, we'll see you next week. Take care. Bye-bye.